www.greaterbostonmedia.com. I'm Jennifer McKim. Tonight on Greater Boston, we'll dig into the charges against Donald Trump for illegally holding onto nuclear secrets and other classified documents, and the violent rhetoric Trump's supporters are responding with. Should we be concerned about another January 6th style attack? Then, inequality at your local grocery store. A group of teen investigators found a major disparity in prices. Two of them joined me ahead. It wasn't just a couple of misplaced memos. In a nearly 50-page indictment detailing 37 charges, including potential violations of the Espionage Act, federal prosecutors accused former President Donald Trump of illegally holding onto hundreds of classified and top-secret documents. The documents included info about defense and weapons capabilities, U.S. nuclear programs, and potential vulnerabilities of the U.S. and its allies, all of which would pose serious damage to national security in the wrong hands. Prosecutors say Trump kept all of that sensitive information strewn about his Florida estate, with boxes stacked up in offices, a storage room, a bathroom, and the ballroom of Mar-a-Lago. The feds also include a conversation that makes it clear Trump knew what he was doing was wrong. After showing a writer, a publisher, and two of his staffers a series of documents, he said, quote, isn't that amazing? Except it's like highly confidential, secret. This is secret information. Look, look at this. Trump even later acknowledged that the documents weren't declassified, saying, see, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. Now, however, ahead of his indictment, the former president and current presidential candidate says he did nothing wrong. I'm an innocent man. I'm an innocent person. That's up for a judge to decide. I'm now joined by Michael Astru, former associate counsel to George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan. Thanks, Mike, for well, thanks coming for today. Me. Yeah. Very much appreciate it. To start with, can you just let us know what's going to be happening tomorrow? Well, what's going to happen is going to be basically the start of the trial. And one of the things that's a little bit of a surprise is Judge Eileen Cannon, who handled the civil part of the, uh, this dispute, um, is looks like she's going to be handling the trial. And that is going to be a little bit of a game changer. If you look at how she handled the civil trial, um, she leaned over way far over in favor of President Trump, and she didn't show very much of an understanding of the Constitution, and she got slapped down pretty nastily by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. So the first thing is to see um, how Judge Cannon is handling some of these early motions. That's important. The second thing that I think is important to look for is what kind of legal team does he have at this point? Um, uh, President Trump has always been tough on lawyers, tough on, I think, a lot of his employees, but particularly on lawyers. He hasn't had particularly effective legal representation since he left the White House until fairly recently. His recent team, I think, has been reasonably impressive, but they've all either quit or been fired. It's hard to know what, and I think he's down to one with lawyer, the last I heard. So my guess is that the first thing that will happen will be a request um, for a delay and that he does not have effective representation of counsel. And I think that may be a sign of what's to come because if you read the actual indictment, and I encourage everyone to do it, and PBS has done us all a great service by putting it online on their website, so I encourage everyone. It's pretty simple and straightforward. If you're a junior high school student, you're going to be able to go online and read this and understand it. And I think it helps a lot. Uh, to understand what's going on. He doesn't have a lot of, President Trump does not have a lot of real good options here. Um, so, yeah, that was so interesting you said about reading the, the documents. I read them also, yeah. and yes, there's so much interesting um, stuff for anybody to right. to read. Um, as we saw just now, he said he did nothing wrong. Um, he calls it a witch hunt, that it's po politically motivated. What, um, like, and he compares himself to President Biden, who we also found classified documents in his garage, in his house, and Hillary Clinton's emails. What's the difference? What distinguishes what he did to, to that? It's a very skillful indictment. Um, so when you read the indictment carefully, what they've, done basically is anticipate that objection. And so the actual removal of the documents from the White House 
to uh, residences in Florida and New Jersey really isn't the basis for any of the counts. Everything goes to basically what happened after the government started saying, we need to get these back. And, and did they get them back at that point? Was it truthful? Was there other, essentially, obstruction? And so that's how they've built their whole case. So it limits the um, president's ability to come back and, and you know, scream uh, selective prosecution. But even if they hadn't done that, it's not much of a defense. There was a 1996 Supreme Court case called Armstrong that pretty much blew out um, selective prosecution as a defense in criminal cases. Peter Navarro, who was a senior official at the Trump White House, tried to raise one recently and he got blown out of the water in the courts as well. So it doesn't help from a legal matter. The, the only little wedge there is is if you make this case effectively in the court of opinion and it starts infiltrating to, to people who serve on the jury, as much as you try to screen people from that, you can't 100%. Um, and to the extent that that takes, you could see someone, you could see a juror or two holding out because they have this sense of unfairness, even though the judge, if the judge is handling the case correctly, will tell the jury that they're not allowed to consider that. And if the judge breaks ranks again and does something unusual, then they'll have to do it all over again and the Court of Appeals will tell her exactly um, how she has to instruct the jury. So it's been um, pretty impressive already that we're hearing, or not that it's expected that we're hearing a lot of supporters of Donald Trump going along with this idea that it's a witch hunk, mm -hmm. and also saying that this is actually a declaration of war, an act of war to the, the um, United States. Um, one of the people who we've heard speak is former gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake from Arizona, who, who said this. If you want to get to President Trump, you're going to have to go through me, and you're going to have to go through 75 million Americans just like me. Most of us are card-carrying members of the NRA. How concerned are you about threats of violence like that? Well, I'm very concerned. I mean, um, you know, we've had January 6th. Um, I think that some of the fabric of our democracy has been torn and people are more willing to resort to violence than in the past. And it's on both extremes. Um, but um, people like Carrie Lake um, are deliberately stirring it up and I think that's reprehensible. When we look at um, before January 6th, sort of the before that happened to this where we're looking, what's the difference between then and now? Is there, I mean, is there, we are concerned, but do you, do you think the, the validity of it is, is really there? Or what can you tell us about the differences? The differences? Of before the roll-up of January 6th to now, and are we, is the government more prepared for something? Or yeah. is it a different, are we in a different place? I, I think that, I think we've been moving in this direction um, slowly for a long time and then more aggressively in recent years. Um, and, um, and rage is much more part of um, voters' decision-making than it used to be. I hadn't done door-to-door um, -door for 20 years, but I did in the New Hampshire primary in 2016. And one of the things that was strikingly difficult, I mean, they've always been a tough crowd up there, but um, the number of people who would just come to the door and scream at me, not knowing even which campaign I was with, was remarkable. And the number of people who were trying to decide bet between Sanders and Trump was remarkable because it was all about which candidate was channeling the rage. So we've moved to being a much more angry culture. Um, the Washington culture has changed. Um, when I served in the White House, it was still close enough to the Watergate era that the Watergate reforms were pretty sacrosanct. And on a bipartisan basis, you know, the lawyers for um, Carter helped us when we came in. We helped the Clinton lawyers, you know, when they came in. There was this feeling really of, we don't want to go down this road again. Um, but when I was back in Washington the last time, I could observe that a lot of those things um, were eroded in the and the, the care for the ethics reviews um, and the FBI background checks, a lot of that had been thrown out 
Um, and that's very disturbing. And, and, and you just get those things, those little things that are the basis for a secure democracy have been eroded fairly substantially. So what do you think the government should do now to make sure that, that we don't have a repetition of January 6th? Well, um, I think, I don't know what the government can do. Um, I mean, the government can provide more security in situations like this and that kind of thing. But ultimately, you know, this is a cultural problem. We don't believe and protect democracy the way that we once did. And so I think that it's important for groups that can have a say on this to get together, get together on a bipartisan basis and try to work together to move us back in the direction where we're talking to each other civilly, we're respecting the laws that have been passed. We periodically re review the laws to make sure that they still make sense. And that kind of dialogue is just not happening in Washington anymore. So we need prominent groups to do that. We need individuals to start pressing their elected representatives to, to do this, to tell them that this is important. And, and you know, it's going to be hard, but that's, I think, what needs to happen. So uh, we're heading into this new criminal case, and as well as several others that are likely showing up, just in this one in particular, what do you think the timeline is? Well, that's going to be very interesting because um, President Trump, as I said, doesn't have a lot of options. I think one of them is to have a ground war and try to delay it um, through the election. Um, and then if he wins, um, we'll go right into a full constitutional crisis. But you know, he may see that as his only way through. And so I'm reasonably confident that we'll start seeing delaying tactics, that we'll see a request for delay so that he can get a full legal team. Um, he may go ahead and try to do the selective prosecution defense, just simply to eat up time to have Judge Cannon decide and then possibly have to go up to the Court of Appeals again to get, get her decision clarified if it's not correct. I mean, there's a lot of things that a skilled legal team can do to delay a criminal trial. I mean, you think, I mean, how long did it take to prosecute, you know, the, um, the bombers here? Um, so um, I think we're going to see delaying tactics, and I think the hope is going to be on the Trump side that he wins the election, then he doesn't have to worry about it anymore. Do you think that having all these ongoing, uh, already he's been indicted twice in the last two months, both in state and federal court, we have several coming up. Yeah. I mean, do you think in any way this helps his case? Um, ultimately, I don't think so. I mean, if you read the, the polls, um, it hasn't had the impact that it traditionally, um, this kind of result would have. And I think that goes back to my point before that Americans are so angry that they're really not looking at things with a, a clear eye. You know, they've made up their minds, they're angry about it, and they're not going to change their opinion. So it's not hurting him for the moment um, as much. Um, on the other hand, this is a long, drawn-out process. A lot of this evidence that's laid out in the indictment is not pretty. Um, and at some point, I do think there will start to be an erosion of support. Um, I think that the party establishment, such as it is, um, is actually going to start worrying about winning the elections next year. Um, so there are a lot of things that can happen. But, it, you know, he's not going to go away. It's, he's not going to crumble easily. And I think there's some possibility that he's going to be able to drag this trial out, you know, the full year and a half that it would take to... Um, you know, uh, get his only path through, I think. What do you think are the most alarming parts of the indictment? I mean, having worked at the White House and handled a lot of secure documents, I mean, I handled most of the end of Iran-Contra, for instance. So, um, you know, uh, uh, the whole notion that you would do anything other than go to the safe, take out the documents only when you needed them to do what you needed to do, and then not put them back in the safe is you know, appalling to me. I had a colleague who was disciplined um, because he had taken out uh, secure documents from his safe, worked on them, forgotten to put them back in the safe. His office was locked. The old executive office building is a very secure building, but they went around and checked for these kinds of evening, and they saw secure, uh, national security documents on his desk, and he got an official reprimand for that. So, I mean, that's the environment 
that I worked in, um, where they took it with that degree of seriousness, and that's really instilled into my core. So all these things, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of, you know, it's, it's in the bathroom, it's being showed to this person, you know, it's in the kitchen, it's, you know, it's falling out of boxes and it's mixed in with, you know, other th I mean, it, there's a lot and of- And also actually saying that he wanted to keep that information from prosecutors. Yes, yes, and all those, I mean, so, uh, I'm just basically, by a lot of the allegations, I'm horrified by them. You know, assuming that they're true, they're horrible. Um, I don't know how to rank them. You know, what is, what is the worst, what is the least worth? I just react so viscerally to them, I can't, can't rank them. Okay, well, um, we're, we're close to done. I'd love to ask okay. you what your last thoughts are on, on this as we're moving forward, if you can give us some final yeah. thoughts. Yeah, um, I think that... Um, this is not going to be a pretty spectacle. I mean, I think this is going to be um, ugly. I think that at the end of the day, I, that um, former President Trump is going to have trouble um, recruiting and holding on to a top legal team. You know, he went for all the, <clears throat> the election um, challenges. You know, he had a clown show for lawyers. The lawyers he's had for the criminal defense have been much better, but as I mentioned before, they're gone. So I think the first thing to look for is, is he going to be able to recruit quality lawyers? Is he going to be able to use the fact that he has to do that as the first start for a delay? That may be a sign of what they're trying to do tactically. Um, and then you have to settle in because I don't think that this, even though this has a lot of the features of an open shut case, if you're looking at it objectively. The way the process works, it's not going to be open and shut quickly. I think this is going to be long, painful, and not people will be very glad, I think, when it's over. Well, thank you so much for your okay. time. I, Mike Astor, it's so great to have you here. Thanks we for appreciate inviting me. your time. Yeah. Next up, we know that there are some glaring inequalities and disparities in Boston, from health care and life expectancies to housing and net worth. But what about your local grocery store? A group of local teens had suspicions food cost more in their neighborhood, so they decided to investigate. They're part of the Hyde Square Task Force, a community youth organization in Jamaica Plain, and they found that the stop and shop in their neighborhood charged more than $30 more for the exact same groceries at the store's location in Dedham a well-off Boston suburb. That's a 15% disparity. Two of those young sleuths join me now to discuss their findings, Eunice Yo-Yo and Danny Vargas. I should note we reached out to Stop and Shop for a comment and to invite them to join our discussion today. But at the time of this taping, we've not heard back. Eunice and Danny, thank you for joining me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I am a investigative journalist myself, and I just want to congratulate you and tell you that this is the type of work that we're all so proud of doing. And um, so congratulations. I'd like to start a little bit with, can you explain to me a little bit about what your task force does? How about you, Eunice, you start. Hyde Square Task Force is a youth development organization located in the Latin Quarter of Jamaica Plain. Um, we do a lot of different work, um, like civic engagement um, and community organizing, which is what we're part of. We also focus on Afro-Latin um, music, dance, and theater, and um, we allow youth to explore those and also post-high school career education. Um, basically making youth more well-rounded and allowing them to have a community outlet in which they can um, use their talents and their creativity at an after-school program. I love that. Can you just tell me your age also? I am 15 years old. 15. And Danny, how old are you? I am a young 18. 18 years <laughs> old. Can you tell me how you started this investigation? Why did you come up with this? Where did you come up with this idea? So a couple of youth at Hyde Square wanted to overlook the effects of inflation in their community. They then found an article where they had a few, a few details spelled out. And inflation, due to low-income neighborhoods and high-income neighborhoods, such as ones in JP and Dedham, they found that on average people spend more money in low-income neighborhoods than they afford to do in high-income neighborhoods. So they wanted to test that. The, then, the youth then went over into the stop and shop in JP and they took a couple of pictures of certain food items where they then compared those to then Dedham. They took the same amount of food, they took pictures, and then they then compared them and found that the average spending was $35 of difference. So 
then we then converse and we wanted to do something about it. That's pretty spectacular finding, really. Um, it's something that you often suspect when you go to different stores, but to actually have decided to do that sort of primary source documentation is, is impressive to me. So for you, how did you feel when you confirmed these suspicions? It was kind of um, flabbergasting in a way um, because, you know, you kind of go grocery shopping. You're just like, did I pay like $2 for this the other day at this location? Um, but then you're just like, oh, maybe I'm just like remembering something the wrong way. But when you actually compare the receipts side by side and you see that you're spe spending 18% more um, in your own local neighborhood, you're just like, astonished as to and confused as to why um, the prices have been different at the same store that sells the same exact brands and the same products. So astonished and confused. Were you mm -hmm. able as part of your invest investigation to find out why there's such a disparity in foods in different communities? We have tried again and again to contact Sop and Shop and see why they market the way that they do. But unfortunately, due to several weeks and Stop Shop being a proprietary business, they unfortunately have not given us a clear answer on to why they keep marketing the way that they do and why low-income neighborhoods pay more than those with high-income neighborhoods. Danny, how does it make you feel to, to, ha to discover that, to have substantiate those findings? It's a tough pill to swallow. Uh, average on week, I go to Stop and Shop maybe three or four times a day. Sometimes my parents just go out into the week and then they buy the groceries, they come back here. We usually have a food stamp and that keeps us supplied. Uh, my father works and he usually brings up the, the money that we need in case the food stamp runs out. Uh, unfortunately, no, that's not always the case. Sometimes maybe money is low and we've used the food stamp already in like the first couple of weeks. So now we have to depend on my dad to have the rest of the groceries come in, such as maybe rice or eggs. Maybe there's no milk in the fridge. And to see it at all gone, it's just, it's partially to the stop and shop because it's the grocery or supermarket that's right there across from my neighborhood. I live in US Census Shock 812, and I've been living there for 18 years, no, 15 years now. And to just, it feels like I've been robbed for 15 years. That's so compelling. What a, what a, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, so you tried to reach out to Stop and Shop and they gave you no answers. Mm -hmm. What else have you done to um, amplify your findings, which are outrageous and exactly what you said, um, important for people to know because these are real people's lives. Well, just like we're doing right now, we've gone out to the media to try and advocate and let the world know about what's going on and what we're finding in our community. Um, and we've received a lot of feedback and a, a lot of comments um, from supporters saying that they've experienced the same thing at different shop and shop locations in their own communities. Um, and right now what we're trying to do is um, go out to different community leaders and organizations um, and present our findings and our research um, and gain more feedback and insight as to what we can do to take action on um, this issue before um, doing anything. Have you talked to any lawmakers? Have you brought it to the state house? Um, we are on the way to a meeting with some um, Boston City Councilors about this issue, and tomorrow we have a meeting with the Massachusetts Attorney General um, or the Cabinet of the Attorney General on this um, about this research and these this issue. That's so incredible. I'm, I'm just curious. You had mentioned. Um, that you have um, aspirations to be a journalist. Yes. I feel like you're definitely going in the right direction with this type of work. This is exactly what um, you love to do, to have amazing findings and bring them to people who can, can make a difference. Um, so what's next on your agenda? Do you have other plans in the future after this? After we've discussed with the Attorney General, we plan on meeting with more people, those who have power to then make a difference because one of our goals here is to have food equity spread across throughout Boston and the English Channel, the East Coast of New England. Uh, food equity is a major issue. Some people don't have the necessary funds to supply themselves with nutritional food and they may often or not just end up buying maybe junk food or maybe stuff that's very low in cost, which then leads to them being either malnourished or sometimes even obese if that's the case. 
Have you um, considered expanding this, um, these findings to sort of, when, when I do investigative work, generally you find a really great sort of anecdotal thing and then you kind of build on it. Have you ever thought of kind of expanding your findings to? Yes. Um, after we've discussed with local community leaders and Boston City Councilors um, and we've received feedback, um, we want to take action, and not only is this an issue that is happening just in Jamaica Plain and Dedham, but we've also learned that this is um, spread throughout um, all the Stop and Shop's location around the um, Northeast regions. And so we would like to see if Stop and Shop can make their um, pricing more equitable across these different locations, and we would, um, we would like in the future, if it's possible, to expand um, this project and um, make prices more equitable for all communities. Have you seen other research that's looked into this in, in other communities? Has, I mean, that this is a, a widespread problem? Um, we haven't seen it firsthand, but we've gotten a lot of firsthand accounts from um, different people who have contacted us about um, their local stop and shops and how they've went to different locations um, that are near them. And they've have been experiencing the same exact issue as what we found in our research. It's um, really uh, very impressive work. So last um, thoughts for you, Danny. What, what, what do you want people to know? Uh, I want people to know, or we want people to know, that although Stop and Shop is a very big corporation, then there's at least 400 or so stores around all of the US. Uh, sometimes corporations should be consistent in their and their di wide diversity. Uh, food prices should be the same in general locations, but to have some places higher and some are lower, whereas people with low, less money are paying higher prices for the same amount of food products, it's, it's outrageous. Well, thank you both so much for coming. I'm gonna really great to meet you, and I hope to see you in the newsroom again some other time. Thank you. That's it for tonight, but come back tomorrow for a reunion between patients who needed a med flight to get them to urgent critical care and one of the pilots who saved their lives. That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. I'm Jennifer McKim. Good night.